Hey, what's going on, everybody? How we doing out in the world? Good to see you all. Uh, thanks for tuning in to a new episode of Bright More Light Live. Uh, my name is Ryan Collins. I'm the executive director of the Midwest Writing Center. Uh, it's great to uh, be back with you. Sorry uh, that I missed you all uh, last week. Uh, I had to deal with the death in the family. Uh, so not the best week to be online uh, doing stuff like this, but uh, glad to be back and uh, glad to be back here with you. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things uh, before we get going. Uh, just a couple of heads up. So uh, today we're not 100% sure, but we just got uh, a little bit of notice uh, from some of our friends at Molly High School. Uh, they do a, a book club, uh, which they had invited me to uh, attend this month. Uh, because they were reading a copy of the Atlas. Uh, one of our terrific interns from 2019, Jamie Wilkander, uh, is part of that group. Uh, if she's out there, hi, Janie. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so she had suggested to her book club at uh, Lean that they read uh, this issue, which was very cool. So a couple months ago, uh, I took them a box full of magazines. Uh, they had a chance to read through them. So they were going to like chime in and uh, ask some questions, maybe. Uh, they're meeting at exactly the same time we're meeting, so I'm hoping uh, we might hear from them. I guess we'll see. Um, so we're not sure when that'll be happening, or if that'll be happening, but if it will, we'll let you know. That would be great to have some questions from some, some students. Um, what else? Um, uh, on that note, uh, the YW note, um, we're still taking applications for the Young Emerging Writers Summer Internship Program. Uh, we're going to accept applications uh, through the 25th. Um, we had pushed it back to the 20th, uh, but uh, after talking to some people, uh, getting some feedback from some teachers, some students out there, uh, we're just going to push it another few days. Uh, so uh, if you are 15 or 19 years old, uh, and you're interested in writing or magazine design, graphic design, anything like that, or if you know somebody who uh, fits that description, uh, please put them in touch. Uh, we'll throw all the information online. Find it on our website at www.mwcqc, uh, as in Midwest Writing Center, quadcities.org, mwqc.org, or mwcqc.org, excuse me. Uh, the other thing that we are doing uh, also on the website uh, is we are taking registration for our annual writing conference, uh, which will also be held uh, in virtual space. Um, we've got terrific workshop instructors. Uh, we've got five classes that we're offering, uh, poetry, novel, uh, memoir writing, uh, uh, short stories, uh, and then also uh, a combined class that's going to be taught by Misty Irvin and Holly White Ben Bali uh, on uh, polishing up your work, revision, uh, submitting, working with agents, and things like that. So uh, we also have keynote speaker, the amazing Liz Lenz, uh, who is a columnist at the uh, Cedar Rapids Gazette. Uh, and the author of two books, her second book is coming out this summer. Uh, we're so glad that she'll be back with us. So if you haven't checked that out, please check that out. Uh, we'll be making a lot of noise about it, but we'd love to have as many people participate as possible. Uh, We'll still be doing free public events, probably streaming. Uh, so even though we can't uh, be together, we're still going to be uh, and be writing. Uh, so please join us. It'll be cool to check it out. And also, last thing, um, the Midwest Training Center uh, does a, an annual meeting uh, every year. Uh, our annual meeting will be uh, next week on the 27th at uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, if you're interested in tuning in, uh, it's something that we do every year. Well, we'll be putting out an annual report for uh, 2019, kind of here you. So if you want to check that out, you can. We'll put more information about that on the Facebook page and up on our website. Uh, but uh, I think it's that part of the day uh, where we should do a little free writing, kind of reset, and, uh, make some adjustments to get into to language mind. So collect my items here. Uh, my notebook, uh, or my notepad, I guess. I got my pen. Uh, excuse me. Grab my timer. Uh, 
Um, so, thinking about uh, thinking about the readings that we're going to look at today, um, and, and, and just kind of a lot of things. I guess recently, if you're looking for a prompt, as I find my clock here, um, if you're looking for a prompt for this free free write or something to write into, um, how about uh, the impossible? Um, whatever that means to you, however you would interpret interpret broadly, um, I always do. Uh, uh, maybe that means impossible circumstances. Maybe that means um, overcoming difficulty of some kind. Uh, maybe that just means uh, pushing the limit of your imagination to that which is not uh, possible, uh, or at least that we don't know or believe that is possible uh, in our current physical reality. Whatever that means, however you want to do it, um, let's go with uh, impossible for a theme. Uh, and then we'll talk about some more impossible things um, in, a, in some impossibly great time. Uh, so I've got my timer, official timer. Uh, so here we go. Writing into the impossible. See you in five minutes. Happy writing.
All right. Beat beat memes five minutes are up. So I hope that was I got something out of that. Um, a couple people uh, wrote me last week and asked if I could read uh, my free rights, which seems like uh, strange and uh, vaguely dangerous. Uh, but I'm sure I can do that um, if it maybe encourages people or gets people interested. Or whatever. Um, so um, yeah, this is mine. Possible. Um, I'm gonna do my best to read uh, my handwriting because uh, those of you out there know. Um, my handwriting and stuff. So I might not be able to read it right now, so let's just see. Uh, we only know we can't fly because someone told us we couldn't. We cannot be invisible so long as we see each other and tell each other something. With words, we always are place, placeholding. We refuse punctuation as the air refuses to hold our script dragged through smoke which never holds in place long enough to be fully legible. Then can we ever read ourselves fully and clearly with all the smoke collecting in our minds? How will we ever return to ground if we tell ourselves we have no weight or mass? So, uh, so that, that was my uh, rewrite, Giddy. Uh, uh, maybe it'll end up somewhere, or maybe it'll just uh, we'll see. Um, so yeah, so today, um, I want to talk about a couple poems uh, that uh, my friend Sarah, um, who's running things, I think we'll, we'll put up and share. Um, I was thinking broadly of uh, uh, of, of about love poems. Uh, it was uh, my 15th anniversary, uh, our 15th anniversary yesterday. My long-term partner, Kate. Hi, Kate. If you're out there, uh, happy anniversary. Um, um, uh, that are uh, so meaningful. Um, uh, if we don't have uh, love in them, right? Uh, or, or sort of allergies or poems that are uh, or, or, or something that has recently gone away or passed on. Um, in some way, shape, or form, whatever that uh, means uh, to you or means in the context of whatever poem or story or whatever we're talking about. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that to me feels like an act of love. Um, if there wasn't love there in the first place, um, why would we be writing about that? So, uh, let's look at, first I want to look at a poem by a guy named Matthew Yeager. Um, he's a really terrific poet. Uh, he lives in New York City. Uh, he curates a uh, reading, uh, reading series. Uh, he curates, I think, the Monday Night Readings at uh, KGB, a uh, really, uh, famous uh, bar reading venue in New York City. Um, hold on a sec. I'll see if I can mic up. And I've got one three things. Sorry if the audio is. means that there's always something. But uh, yeah, Matt Yeager um, curates that series. He's also the author of a collection of poems uh, called Like That, uh, which was published by the terrific folks at uh, Forklift, Ohio, uh, Forklift, Inc. Uh, this poem you can find on the uh, Academy of American Poets page. Let's see if that's any better for people. Um, yeah, uh, this, uh, poem, um, uh, actually it has the audio, so we'll get to hear Matt read it. Uh, but yeah, he's the author of Like That, which came out, uh, Forklift Books in 2016. Uh, yeah, uh, why don't we just hear it? Uh, I'm going to have Sarah maybe play it a couple times because I think, um, even though the language is not difficult, I think, uh, well, it's always worth hearing uh, a poem more than once. Uh, uh, just so we can kind of absorb it a little bit uh, more deeply, uh, especially as we're doing this kind of quickly in, uh, in a very short time frame. Um, so it's only like a minute long or so, so we'll hear it a couple times. But also I think the language is really simple. Um, it's, it's not a difficult poem to understand necessarily, but like uh, just the turns of phrase and everything kind of keeping track, uh, particularly toward the end, I think it's really worthwhile. So I'll let Sarah play this one twice with maybe a little pause in between. 
and uh, kind of get into that a little bit. I am Matthew Yeager. This is Poem to First Love. To have been told I love you by you could well be for me the highlight of my life, the best feeling, the best peak on my feeling graph in the way that the Chrysler building might not be the tallest building in the New York sky, but is the best, the most exquisitely spired, or the way that Hank Aaron's career home run total is not the highest, but the best, the one that signifies the purest greatness. So improbable to have met you at all, and then to have been told in your soft young voice, so soon after meeting you, I love you. And I felt the mystery of being that you, of being a you and being loved. And what I was instantly was someone who could be told I love you by someone like you. I was in that moment new. You were 19, I was 22. You were impulsive. I was there in front of you with a future that hadn't yet been burned for fuel. I had energy, you had beauty, and your eyes were a pale blue, and they backed what you said with all they hadn't seen. And they were the least ambitious eyes I'd known, the least calculating. And when you spoke and when they shone, perhaps you saw the feeling you caused. Perhaps you saw, too, that the feeling would stay. I am Matthew Yeager. This is Poem to First Love. To have been told I love you by you could well be for me the highlight of my life, the best feeling, the best peak on my feeling graph in the way that the Chrysler building might not be the tallest building in the New York sky, but is the best, the most exquisitely spired, or the way that Hank Aaron's career home run total is not the highest, but the best, the one that signifies the purest greatness. So improbable to have met you at all, and then to have been told in your soft young voice, so soon after meeting you, I love you. And I felt the mystery of being that you, of being a you and being loved. And what I was instantly was someone who could be told I love you by someone like you. I was in that moment new. You were 19, I was 22. You were impulsive. I was there in front of you with a future that hadn't yet been burned for fuel. I had energy, you had beauty, and your eyes were a pale blue, and they backed what you said with all they hadn't seen. And they were the least ambitious eyes I'd known, the least calculating. And when you spoke and when they shone, perhaps you saw the feeling you caused. Perhaps you saw, too, that the feeling would stay. All right. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, pointing that. So, uh, so yeah, um, I think uh, the first thing I love about this poem is, uh, like I said, how, how simple it is, right? Like, what a beautiful uh, thing. I, I'd like to think uh, most people, for the first time, uh, uh, someone said uh, that they loved them um, or that they said that to someone else. Uh, so, I mean, just capturing that really beautiful, kind of simple, uh, you know, instant moment, I think, is really great. Um, but also just like uh, the way that it talks about, uh, the way it tries to capture the act of speech. Uh, this is something that both poems are going to get today, sort of play with. Um, you know, poetry comes from an old tradition, right? Um, before we had um, uh, papyrus scrolls or tablets or paper or anything else, uh, poems were recited, poems were shared um, orally um, and handed down that way. Um, and both of these poems are sort of like playing with that idea of playing with the speech. Um, obviously, here the speech is very simple, but very heartfelt, very direct. Um, and and you know, we've got that spoken breath right in the first line that I've been told I love you, uh, by you could well be for me. And then we get into these superlatives, right? Uh, the highlight of my the, the, the best peak on my feeling graph. Um, I hope everyone's feeling graph is, is, is on the uptick uh, in, in the black. Uh, so to speak, I love the feeling graph idea. Uh, so I hope if you have one, it's thriving, doing well. Um, but then we get this like spatial comparison with the Chrysler Building, which is this really famous, really beautiful uh, building in New York City. Uh, which, if you're not familiar with it, you know, is it's not the tallest, um, but as Matt says, uh, is the is the most exquisitely spired. Uh, or the way that Hank Aaron's career 
home run total is not the highest, but the best signifies the purest greatness. The purest greatness kind of, I think, really um, ties in with that first time of being told uh, that you are loved uh, by someone that's not, you know, a blood relative of yours, probably. I'm assuming, uh, not really too much into this, I hope not. Uh, but uh, I also think, uh, um, so, and then we get this, so, uh, but with those two references uh, to the Chrysler building, also to uh, Hank Aaron, uh, we've got a sense of history and time um, that's also playing out there, um, which you know they, they kind of locates us, but it like also speaks to a sort of like timelessness, right? Um, as is usually the case with these poem a day poems, there is a description uh, or a little about the poem uh, that Matt. Uh, included, and he said, Matt, uh, what did he say? He said, I wrote this about a year after Barry Bonds broke Hank Aaron's career home run record. An idea for a Hank Aaron simile began the poem that led to the memory of some fine feelings. Uh, that's about as simple, clear, and direct uh, a process statement of a poem I think as you ever might find. Uh, so, yeah, so it started with this kind of, uh, you know, kind of historical moment, at least in sports. Uh, and the way that that can kind of trigger the memory and trigger associations and kind of spirals out into poems and connects to uh, this first love. Um, I think it's really beautiful and I think it's really instructive uh, in terms of um, you know, just how, how we go about composing and writing poems uh, or writing anything. Um, I think it's great to have a plan. I think a lot of writers often uh, maybe start with a plan exactly where they plot their course and if that works for you that's great whatever works for you um, and it's successful for you is, uh, is, is awesome um, there's a lot of different kinds of process and I think a lot of times in any kind of creative process um, these kind of associations where an event happens or we have sort of a memory um, or some seemingly kind of innocuous uh, triggering subject as Richard Hugo uh, referred to it I've talked about Richard Hugo here before uh, it's both the triggering path. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, we go away from that triggering subject uh, into something maybe profound. Here, it seems from uh, the about the poem that Matt, Matthew gave us uh, that it starts with this this baseball uh, uh, moment of significance uh, and Barry Bonds passing uh, Hank Aaron. Whether I recognize that, uh, I'll leave that to the, the more ardent baseball fans up there. Um, but something like that can trigger uh, an idea for a simile that triggers this poem about love, about first love, right? Um, and maybe not, um, this doesn't strike me as a baseball poem. Maybe it strikes you as a baseball poem. Um, if you want baseball poems out there, there's plenty of them out there. Um, but um, just that leap, right? That little kind of leap. Um, I don't know that there's a way to practice that. I think there's just a way to sort of like open yourself up to that, open up your um, your memory, your experiences, and uh, uh, be open to when something sparks a memory or association to kind of go with that, see what that follows. Um, I think a lot of times uh, that stuff is really uh, useful in writing and generates really interesting work and helps us make connections that we wouldn't otherwise, even with our best laid plans. With that, and also uh, I think Dean Young's, uh, we're going to see some of that in the next poem that we're going to get to. Uh, so there's a lot of similarities between these poems. Uh, but to move on with this one, um, so we get back to this, uh, you know, this purest greatness. And then I love this break, so improbable. Like I love declarations, particularly in love poems. Um, go big. Um, uh, exclamation points sometimes uh, can be uh, expensive. I, I've been told just like adverbs and adjectives can be expensive, um, but they have their place, um, as does all punctuation. So uh, here I really love it. Um, and it kind of speaks to that impossible, right? I, I said we we're going to read a couple of poems that sort of deal with the impossible or make it be improbable, which aren't the same thing, but I feel like uh, uh, are close enough uh, for us to talk about them together here today. Um, but to have met you at all, then to kind of go back in memory to like the first meeting of this person, like the history of this relationship. We have history and architecture, we have history in American sport. Now we have, you know, we've zoomed back into the history of the relationship that we're talking about. I think those are really delightful moves that we get in a couple of uh, 
short lines. Uh, we cover a lot of space. Um, and this description of the voice uh, and being told so soon after. Um, and then my, my favorite part of the poem, uh, the line ending, and I felt the mystery of being that you, of being a you, and being loved. You know, being anybody who's loved, right? Like, that's pretty fantastic. And I love the way that it's um, depersonalized uh, in a way that sort of, like, minimizes the ego. Like, what a wonderful thing to be um, who is told that they are loved, right? Uh, that's pretty beautiful. To be among that number um, is itself a so beautiful thing. And those are kind of, like, separate things. And I love the way that Matt kind of separates them out um, on this really, like, language gram level. Uh, that's sort of where we get these distinctions that are made uh, that both at once are talking about this individual relationship between two people but also kind of touches on something that's much larger and much bigger uh, and and does those things at the same time which is really great um but yeah uh, being loved and what it was instantly someone who could be told loved, uh by someone like you uh and then I love the, these ages. Uh, you were impulsive. I was there in front of you with a future that hadn't yet been burned for fuel. Uh, that's uh, that's a moment for me of the elegiac, I think, a little bit in, in this poem. Um, it's obviously a love poem, but there's like uh, there's something lost there. There's uh, even though that age difference in 22, 19 is not very much, right, uh, in terms of life experience. Maybe not all that different, uh, but I do. It does feel like. Uh, uh, there's a youthful optimism, and that 22 is maybe uh, uh, a little more for wear, or at least a, aware of its own becoming a little more uh, worn uh, by the world. Uh, and so that distinction kind of uh, adding some sweetness uh, to the love that's being described, I think that's really great uh, and makes it a little bit more meaningful, but it's not just uh, uh, kind of pie eyed or like overly nice. Right, it's innocent. I think there's a difference between um, naivete and naivete, excuse me, um, be naive uh, and uh, and be innocent. And I think this poem uh, dwells beautifully with the moment of innocence. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the last thing I was going to say about this. Oh, yeah, and that the the 19 it would be the least ambitious eyes I'd know, the least calculating. You know, there's no, there's no agenda, right? like the, the, the freedom from, like, um, I think a lot of entanglements that uh, we associate with romantic relationships as we get um, older, or maybe just always, uh, you know, this, this seems like sort of like, at least at the start, at least at this moment of speaking uh, and being told that you're alone, uh, that those things are gone, those things are free, right? Uh, and we don't have to worry about those things. And that in and of itself is a, is a kind of innocence, it's kind of beautiful. Uh, but also kind of elegiac because you wouldn't know unless you had had some of those other kind of bad experiences, right? So um, having had that difficulty, um, or here, I guess that implied sort of difficulty that comes with those couple lines, um, really, I think, adds to the sweetness of the love that's being um, shared and remembered at this moment. Um, with that, let's go on to another poem, uh, kind of along a similar lines. Um, uh, this one is from uh, Dean Young, a uh, really well-known American poet. Uh, also, uh, uh, has several books uh, on Copper Canyon and University of Pittsburgh. I can't remember. I don't have his bio here. With all, his, uh, all his accolades and awards, everything. But, uh, very influential poet, I would say, poetry over the last 30 or so years. Uh, and, uh, and and also uh, sort of part of that extended work with the family, I think. Uh, so there's a kind of a shared aesthetic, maybe, a little bit between uh, Matthew Yeager's mom and the poem. So I'll let Sarah pull up uh, the poem that we're going to look at. Uh, this poem is called Scarecrow on Fire. It comes from a book called Fall Higher. Uh, it was published by Cotton Canyon in 2011. Get my face off this while I read this. Uh, I was looking for audio for this. I couldn't find it because Dean is a really terrific reader. Uh, so if it's out there and I couldn't find it, I apologize. Uh, 
to uh, do this from uh, Justice. You can find it obviously at the Poetry Foundation website. Uh, and yeah, so get off your screen. And we're going to read Scarecrow on Fire me, by Dean Young. We all think about suddenly disappearing. The train tracks lead there into the woods. Even in the financial district, wooden doors and alleyways. First, I want to put something small into your hand. A button or a river stone or key I don't know to what. I don't have that house anymore across in the graveyard and its black angel. What counts as a proper goodbye? My last winter in Iowa, there was always a ladybug or two in the kitchen for cheer, even when it's ten below. We all feel suspended over a drop into nothing. Once you get close enough, you see what one is stitching is a human heart. Another is vomiting wings. Hell, even now, I love life. Whenever you put your feet on the floor in the morning, whatever the nightmare, it's a miracle or fantastic illusion. The solidity of the boards, the steadiness coming in the leg. Where did we get the idea when we were kids to rub dirt into the wound? Or was that just in Pennsylvania? Maybe poems are made of rum. The way water cajoled the boil says, This is my soul. Free. Thank you, Sarah, for doing uh, Yeah, it is a very different kind of love poem, um, but I think still definitely a love poem. Um, i to get something off my screen here. Um, I, love, I mean, that first line, you know, we all think suddenly, we all think about suddenly disappearing. Um, uh, yeah, kind of wonderfully simple. Um, and certainly declarative. Uh, you know, it kind of throws down the gauntlet. I love those kind of beyond statements, particularly at the beginning of the poem. Uh, you're kind of either in or out uh, a little bit. And I sort of, uh, I sort of love that. Um, I usually opt in uh, when confronted with such uh, moments to see what poems or stories or whatever. Uh, but then these descriptions of like darkness and uncertainty, uh, train tracks that lead into the woods. Uh, wooden doors and alleyways. Um, but wanted to give a gift before someone goes. I mean, like, right there, I think it's like we've got one, uh, you know, a gift before departing, uh, even with the key to I don't know, uh, which I really love. Um, and a little bit of uh, uh, sort of like place related info or insight to this poem. So uh, it says, I don't have that house anymore across from the graveyard. It's Black Angel. Excuse me, I'm sure the Iowa City folks out there uh, know this is a real place. This is an actual uh, cemetery with an actual uh, black angel, which is uh, very impressive and haunting. Uh, you can do, check it out. You've got black angel in the city. You'll be able to find it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I know that place as well. I've been there many times. Uh, but, uh, you know, so like, if you know that, or if you kind of have a sense of, uh, you know, I think there are other places that probably have Black Angel, other cemeteries. Uh, there used to be one of the Quad Cities, I believe, uh, but it's uh, long since been taken down, um, put in storage somewhere, I believe. Uh, I'll let the Quad City history folks uh, run with that one. Uh, but uh, there's a reality to this, right? There's a documentary aspect to this. There's another part to jump ahead that talks about uh, one is stitching a human heart. Uh, around this time, I think, in the past, I think uh, Dean Young had a, a heart transplant. Um, so there, there's, there's a bunch of poems that sort of deal with that. And I think this is sort of maybe a solution to that as well. Um, while also giving us this really beautiful image uh, that 
that's in contrast to uh, you know, the bomb complaints, which is a little bit more um, violent. Um, but that sort of captures, I think, uh, those two images that really kind of capture the dichotomy I'm interested in, in looking at today. Um, because they strike me as LJ, uh, because this poem particularly strikes me as sort of being aware of uh, its impermanence for the speaker, being aware of uh, his own impermanence, uh, and aware of everybody's, and how we may think about the impermanence. We get that in the first line, right? I'm thinking about suddenly disappearing. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, we all feel suspended over a drop into nothingness. You know, uh, that sort of, I think there's like a little bit of a center of the hand of an angry God illusion there. Uh, so it's kind of got that classic sort of American literature illusion stuff going on, which is, which is nice um, uh, for the more uh, lit professor, uh, crit lit types. Um, but, I, but I love the, the, this intimacy of the, this house. You know, we, and we take a leap, right? We get this key, I don't know the one, and then we think of and that association leads to house, right? And then we no longer have, talking about a house that we no longer have. But what happened in that house that last winter you know, there's always a ladybug or two in the kitchen for cheer. I love that for cheer. Um, as though these ladybugs have persisted uh, solely to provide uh, cheer to the speaker uh, uh, in, in, you know, in 10 below circumstances. Um, I find it very difficult to be cheery uh, when it's 10 below. Uh, but I like to think that maybe a ladybug in such conditions might help me find more cheer, I guess. Um, not a wintry sort of cat, I guess. In any case, um, but we get that sort of description, and then we get another declarative. We all feel, and I love that line break, we all feel suspended over a drop into nothingness, right? Like, we don't know what we're going to feel, and then we get that. We're kind of back into this elegiac, uh, this feeling of impossibility of permanence um, that we're sort of all permeated by at some point, and then we all dwell in. Uh, at some point, maybe sometimes more uh, than others. Um, and then, you know, they kind of zoom in on, you know, one person is stitching the unit mother, another is vomiting, um, which even while disgusting, uh, sort of violent, uh, there's quite there, right? There's like, there's something that, uh, that image almost transcends itself a little bit. There's something about uh, the invocation of flames that probably seems to um, have a lift, you know, pun, pun intended, I suppose. Um, even if it's something uh, prefaced by something like vomit. Um, it sounds terribly painful. Um, I hope none of you ever vomit wings. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm out of options of things I can do about that. Uh, but um, then we get this sort of affirmation wherever you put your feet on the floor in the morning, whatever the nightmare, it's a miracle, fantastic illusion. Um, and that's sort of rooted, like, we've got all these images going from place to place. Uh, you know, hell, even now, like, you know, we just kind of got a description of hell. And, you know, lots of wordplay going here. Lots of kind of reading backwards and forwards of the wordplay that I think is really beautiful. Um, but whenever we get up in the morning, right, whenever we wake up and we know we're on the floor, whatever the nightmare it's a miracle or fantastic illusion. It's to me, it sounds like a love, love, you know, love, love, love is miraculous. Love you know, could be a fantastic illusion. It could be a terrible illusion. It could be a marriage. And it can kind of be all of these things, uh, much like uh, the reality of living. Um, and then, and then this, you know, another sort of association. Where did we get the idea? When we were kids to rub dirt into the world. Uh, or that in just in Pennsylvania. I don't think that was just in Pennsylvania. I don't know. But, uh, cats from other parts of the country, maybe China. Uh, but uh, I like we've got some of that innocence that we have in the first time, right? Like with this illusion of the fact that we're kids. Uh, and, and, and trying to deal uh, with wounds, right? Um, there's something elegiac there to me as well. Uh, that we take you know, the literal earth and try to put it in ourselves uh, to feel better, to diminish the pain, to try to heal. Uh, I think that, you know, while childish, uh, and maybe there's also something beautiful about that, uh, 
and I think uh, you know comes with a perfect place to explore that beauty uh, in the ninth or tenth. Um, and then we close, you know, kind of where that first poem that we wrote started, uh, which is back to breath, back to back to the spoken word. Uh, maybe poems are made of breath, the way water controls the oil. Says, this is my soul. Breathe. Um, you know, it's not a declaration of love. So a told or love share in the same way as the first one. But I do feel like it captures um, maybe a more, more weary, uh, maybe a bit more mature um, idea and a more platonic kind of love, I guess. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of fun uh, in this poem. Uh, so yeah, so those are the readings that I have for today. Uh, I'm going to see if Sarah will throw up a real prompt, excuse me, it's hard today. Um, get it up where I can see it as well. Uh, so, there. So, title's real simple. On um, So, we read Matthew Yeager's poem, First Love and Deed. Being at the Scarecrow and Fire. In both poem to first love and Scarecrow and Fire, we are looking at love. In the first poem, love is a new defined spoken feeling. In the second, love is more fleeting and dreamlike, part of the belief spoken but least directed. The speaker in poem to first love is marveling at being told that he is loved. The speaker in Scarecrow and Fire is marveling that he is still able to tell anyone or anything that he loves. One is more possessed by love, while the other explores how love can be possessed like a button or river stone or key, even if it's a key the speaker don't know to what. So think about love as something that we look forward to, something to look back on, something that possesses us, something that we possess. Love is an abstraction, right? And like one time, uh, the the way that we talk about this a lot of times in young emerging writers is, uh, um, I guess we're giving away with teams here, but uh, we ask everybody, uh, you know, people uh, love their love their mom, love their dad, usually love their mom, um, all hands go up, or whomever, someone in the family, brother, sister, hands go up. Cool. Show us what that looks like. It's easy to say I love you, uh, but show us like what are, what is the action that we associate with that? So like, the paper as we see in some uh, in these two oh, it's actual, right? Uh, uh, but what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Um, what are the sensory uh, forms and shapes uh, that love you have experienced in your life takes, has taken, might take in the future? What are they like? What do you hope they might be like? Then write about something or someone that you love. It could be a person or people, living or dead. If dead, perhaps, you know, maybe that more elegiac tone is something to, 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 to seek out or, or include in some way. Um, it could be a place. It could be a memory. It could be an activity, as in something you love to do. It could be a force, something that you look forward to, something that you miss, something that motivates or inspires you, something you feel like you cannot live without, something that gives you hope. Try to make your life as concrete as possible. How do you describe love using things you can see, touch, feel, smell, taste? If you like, you could write a poem or whatever you want to write. It doesn't have to be a poem or not foundational. Uh, to a specific person or thing or idea. Only one catch. You cannot use the word love anywhere. And I think if we go back through, obviously the first poem uh, wouldn't follow that. But uh, I'm pretty sure the D young poem does not include the word love. So uh, I'm not going back. Oh, yeah, hell no, even I'm like, okay, one. Uh, you got me. Uh, but see if you can do it without. If you can't do it without, um, break the rules. These aren't rules. It's a prompt, not rules. So it's meant to be manipulated. Uh, then uh, whatever you want. Uh, but try to write something into love. And I think the other um, the other thing that is valuable about 
doing this kind of prompt or this kind of exercise. Uh, I think usually when we think of love prompts, we think first and most about sort of romantic relationships, right? And that's great. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's just, I think, a very common uh, primary association of people. But um, there is, there are, excuse me, uh, many other kinds of love out in the world, and love takes many forms. And uh, perhaps this is maybe an opportunity to consider uh, uh, something that you love in a different way, or maybe to consider something that you love that maybe you weren't really aware of how much it meant to you, uh, or maybe that you loved it at all, or that at all, that the person it meant to you personally. Um, so that's the prompt I came up with today. Uh, I hope you dig it. Uh, got a few more minutes left. It looks like people got questions or anything like that. Uh, I have not seen any signs of our high school friend. Try and see if we've got it. questions or anything like that or if you want to share a little bit of what you love or how you love or who you love we'd love to hear from you um, if you've got favorite love poems or love stories or anything like that um, please share them we always love recommendations we're happy to amplify that stuff but, or if you maybe want to share uh, get the uh, like i did it could be a little scary, but sometimes it doesn't hurt. Um, and uh, you know, I think generally people are a lot more supportive of those who share their work with us than a lot of the gifts maybe would be. So, yeah. Don't, don't be afraid if you are afraid. It'll be okay. Especially with the right center. Uh, we really try to encourage uh, first time readers when we do open mics and things like that. Uh, we love people who are just going to start now. Uh, they don't feel comfortable in that book. Uh, because they are. They should be. Uh, we think that's the best way to encourage people to, to write more life into their lives. So fire away if you have questions. And if you're out there, people, uh, please definitely send questions. I would love to talk about the yeah, apps. So just since I brought it up, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so uh, for in that Dean Young poem, uh, reference the Black Angel. For those of you who might be interested in checking that out sometime, uh, uh, it's in Oakland Cemetery. Uh, this is all from Wikipedia. Uh, which is located on the north side of Iowa City, Iowa, served as the main cemetery for Iowa City since 1943. I actually have uh, some of my extended paternal family members, uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's there. Um, so the Black Angel, which is makes up most of the Wikipedia page, is no surprise. A locally famous monument, the 8.5 foot tall Black Angel statue by Mark Corbin, was erected in 1913 as a memorial to Nicholas Feldebert. Local lore and superstition surround this beautiful but eerie scene. Uh, 
and then it's got the whole story, which I guess can be any question. Are these poems free verse? There we go. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Terry. Uh, yeah, these poems would be considered uh, free verse, uh, I think. Uh, they don't necessarily have uh, any uh, you know, stanza breaks or rhymes or what stanza. There's no rhyme scheme to them. Obviously, they have, you know, I'm not going to get into the scansion of them right now. But if you, uh, so I don't know that the lines are not like a, a regular uh, number of uh, feet uh, or syllables. Uh, so, yeah, free verse for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, keep it going. Uh, a little bit more on Black Angel. The story of Black Angel dates back to the late 19th century when Teresa Feldover traveled to Iowa City from an area that is now known as the Czech Republic of Slovakia. Her first marriage produced her son, Edward Doziel, uh, who died in Iowa City. Why Teresa had the bronze angel statue made in Chicago by a Czech American sculptor, Marty Koble, and transported to Iowa City to be placed in the cemetery in 1915. Her second husband, Nicholas Feldover's ashes were placed in the repository of the statue. Teresa died in 1944, her place beside her husband. Though the monument displays Teresa's birthday, there is no sign of her death date. Over the years, the bronze statue is oxidized, uh, acquiring a greenish black paint. And there's, yeah, lots of like little bit stuff about it. It's, it is pretty cool. It is also pretty eerie. So show some respect, especially respect to the dead. Remember to Yeah, I mean, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say uh, the the cadence comes back. Uh, you know, I think that that's more process than uh, for those cats. But it does feel um, irregular, I guess, in a natural sort of way, um, which I think is uh, is pretty common. Uh, if you're interested in a contemporary poet. Uh, who is uh, doing a lot of uh, metrics and more things like that. Um, this is no surprise uh, that I would check Shane McRae, um, who's uh, one of the poets I think that's, uh, I think, most concerned with, uh, with meteor shapes. So if you're looking for uh, another one, you can each quick comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of others. It's just not a problem. Let's see. When taking a challenge such as this, what rule does the sensory play? How can you use it? Uh, how did the, did the examples use it? Uh, so keep your senses in mind. Speaking of something you um, want. I think, uh, I, I think particularly like at the DM uh, toward the end, Get uh, wherever you put your feet on the floor in the morning, whatever the nightmare, and feet on the floor, uh, and later on, the solidity of the boards, the steadiness coming to the legs. Uh, that to me is a really interesting image in how it uses the sensory because it's using the tactile sense. Uh, we always, almost always, I guess, uh, write first what we see. Uh, that kind of dominates writing, right? We, we write what we see, we write what we hear uh, secondarily. And then after that, uh, tactile 
olfactory or taste. Uh, those kind of fall by the wayside. Um, tactile probably comes in at number three, but I think it's a distant third. Um, so something like that that gives us a sense of like uh, solidity, um, that sense of standing up on your own two legs and being upright, and kind of embody the embodiment. I think that includes in that. Um, it's maybe not like uh, smell of roses or something, or something like that, or uh, the taste of some delicious food. Uh, those are great too. I think uh, you know. I'm sure if all the time I could find some phones that trade in those examples. Uh, right off the top of my head, struggle a little bit. Uh, but obviously, finding homes that celebrate uh, aesthetic beauty or visual beauty of some kind, uh, they're not hard to find. Uh, I think we get an example of that in Matt Gagger's poem that the, uh, with the reference to the price of building, most explicitly spired. Right? Uh, so that's a, that's a visual sort of sensory description. Uh, so those are just a couple from the poems that we read. Uh, but whatever, I, I guess, uh, Prompt is kind of seeking to do uh, asking you uh, to think about you know, what are the sensory experiences that you must associate with some kind of love, um, and those need not be purely visual or purely sort of aesthetic. Right? Um, uh, I think one of the things you forget about when we talk about uh, taste is like satisfaction or, 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 or feeling cold, feeling cold. Uh, uh, and the olfactory sense is the sense that is most linked in the brain uh, or to the parts of the brain uh, associated with the heat number. Uh, so our olfactory sense, the more you can kind of write that, uh, that is some really rich terrain for kind of triggering some of those memory associations. Um, I guess for me, I think uh, about people I love and my olfactory sense, uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, the smell of fresh cut grass. Uh, uh, it makes me think of my father. My father was a football coach for, for some years. Um, so when I smell fresh cut grass, particularly like in the summer, late summertime, uh, before I can even think about it, my brains are putting images uh, of my father standing on uh, the football field at either Woodrow Wilson Middle School, in high school, or at uh, John or in Illinois, uh, or at John Deere Middle School. So those are a couple examples. I hope that helps maybe a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, any other questions you have, let me know. But I think we're a little past time, so I think we're going to get on. Uh, happy writing. I hope to see you all back here on Thursday. We'll be back, same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you, Sarah, for making everything go. You're awesome. Uh, and happy belated birthday, also. Uh, we hope you have a good one. Uh, and thanks, y'all. Check us out online www.mwcqc.org. Uh, send those applications for YAW. We'd love to have as many talented kids as possible this summer. Uh, participate. Um, and uh, yeah, check out the running conference. It's going to be great. So we'll see you all soon. Take care. See you on Thursday. Have a good one. Cheers.